Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we are going to look at chapter 16 in the OpenStax textbook, looking at in information, risk, and insurance. And the idea here is one of the big ideas in economics that doesn't always get a lot of credit um, or can be harder to understand, but it actually plays a really big role in our life, which is the idea of information costs. And this is just the idea that information has really big value in markets. And we know this a little bit already, right? We talk about price as a way of communicating information about costs and about willingness to pay. Well, now we're gonna talk about information in a different way. And we're gonna be using information, um, we're going to be talking about information in terms of insurance markets and in terms of risk because information plays a really big role in risk. If you think about it, the less information you have, the more risk and uncertainty you might have in a situation. And that plays a really big role in insurance markets because insurance is designed to mitigate or reduce risk. Um, so what we'll be doing is we'll talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. Um, and then we're going to talk about some stuff that you might already have a sense of, but what we're going to do is try to give you the economic text for it, the economic context and the economic terminology. Um, we'll have some fun examples and we'll talk about some really cool things. We'll talk about two of my favorite kind of concepts in this realm, this idea of adverse selection, which Sounds weird, but I promise you actually have thought about it before. Um, we also sometimes call it the lemon problem. Um, and so we'll talk about that, the idea of markets adversely selecting low quality goods and what that means and how information plays a role. We'll talk about information asymmetry or asymmetric information. Remember, these words just come from words we already know. So asymmetry or asymmetric means uneven and then information. So situations where one person knows more than someone else. We'll talk about insurance, which means we'll talk about terms like co-insurance, insurance in general. We'll talk about deductible, co-payment, and co-signer. We'll also talk about collateral. Um, we'll talk about what a fee for service is. You'll want to have a sense of some of these other insurance products, like what an HMO is, HMO stands for Health Maintenance Organization, and it's a, a type of um, way of providing medical services and insurance in that sense. Um, we'll talk about imperfect information versus perfect information and how they're different. We'll talk about what a money-back guarantee means, um, what a moral hazard problem is, and it's a common problem in insurance markets just like adverse selection is. Um, we'll talk about occupational licensing, um, which is just when the government... Um, or another or regulatory organization gives someone a license to do something. So, you know, you can't just wake up and decide, I'm going to be a doctor today. You have to be licensed. And there's requirements around that. Um, we'll also talk about premiums with respect to insurance. We'll talk about risk and risk groups. We'll talk about service contracts. And then finally, we'll talk about warranties, which is another way of helping to solve these information problems. And so that's what this is all about. It's all about this idea that information may not be perfect. One of our assumptions around uh, perfectly competitive models is perfect competition, perfect information. So this is looking at situations where information is not perfect and what tools and ways we can solve it and what problems arise if we don't. So grab your textbook. I'm going to go get the slides. Uh, let's get started uh, talking about information, risk, and insurance. All right, let's get started. So in this chapter, chapter 16, we're going to look at two main sections defining this idea of information asymmetry um, and insurance and risk. We'll start with just the idea of imperfect information, the problem of imperfect information, and the asymmetric information problem. And then we'll sort of take it and expand it and apply it to insurance markets, insurance, and imperfect information and talk about it in terms of how we can use it to solve and manage information markets. So, you know, we always start these chapters with kind of a big idea that tries to tie this uh, concept, these economic concepts, back to our daily life, back to 
to things we might have heard of or experienced. And so here we've got uh, the picture of former President Barack Obama talking about the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And this was one of the signature pieces of legislation um, in the Obama administration in August of 2009. Um, while Congress was on summer recess, President Obama uh, decided to uh, met to discuss a bunch of changes he wanted to make to the insurance market and trying to expand the healthcare system to cover more people, lower the cost, and basically target healthcare um, and patient protection with his Affordable Care Act. Um, the Affordable Care Act became known as Obamacare. And while opponents of the bill said that it was going to be unconstitutional and cost tons of money, proponents said it was going to help people reduce poverty and actually pay for itself over time. People reacted really strongly to this. And we can think about it being because it has to do with health and well-being and taxes and government. Um, but it also has to do with stuff that, you know, besides being stuff that we deal with personally, it also has to do with costs and um, insurance markets, which are things people don't tend to understand very well. And so today we're going to talk about those things. So one, where we want to start with this is this idea of information being either perfect or imperfect. So we're going to talk about the problem of imperfect information and asymmetric information, and then we'll talk about insurance and imperfect information. And so Perfect information is a premise for perfectly competitive markets, and it's this idea that we all know everything. Um, not about everything, but you know, if you're going to buy a good, you know the quality of the good, you have some expectations about how long it will last, what it will do, and those are all reasonable. That's an example of perfect information. So I go to um, buy a can of sparkling water. I have a sense that it's going to be free from pollutants, free from lead. It's going to have a certain quantity. If it says it's 12 fluid ounces, it's going to be 12 fluid ounces. It's not going to make me, you know, grow hair on my face, those kinds of things. Um, that's a perfect information situation. I know everything I need to about this good to make a choice in the marketplace. Asymmetric information and imperfect information are when that's not true. And the big idea here is that instead of the buyer and the seller having the same or decent or useful productive information about the good or service being provided or exchanged, we have situations where that's not true. And so imperfect information is when either a buyer or a seller or both are uncertain about the qualities of the good or service being exchanged, being bought, being sold. Asymmetric information is when the information is imperfect and one person knows more than the other. And so there's an asymmetry. The seller or the buyer has more information than the other person. And this is one of those big things is this idea of information being different, not being perfect, whether it's just imperfect and I just don't know what I'm going to get, or it's asymmetric and the seller knows more than I do as the buyer, or I as the buyer know more than the seller does, those are going to lead to problems in markets. And anytime there's a problem with a market, we need to step in and find a way to fix it. So in the presence of imperfect information, we're going to see buyers and sellers either be discouraged from participating in the market or be doubtful of the market, maybe be skeptical of the market. It's going to influence willingness to pay, willingness to sell, willingness to buy, um, and it's going to influence the market. It's going to make the market function less well. Buyers are not going to want to participate in a market if they can't determine the quality of a good. Sellers might be reluctant to participate if they can't demonstrate the quality of the good to their buyers, right? So think about, and I always give this example if you think about a fruit market. On the one hand, determining the quality of fruit is pretty easy if it's bad, right? I can look at a piece of fruit and say, oh yes, this has blemishes. No, it doesn't. 
But if you've ever been to a farmer's market or even a Costco, um, sometimes they'll give you samples. And that's based on this idea of imperfect information. They believe their good is better than you think it is. And so they're trying to reduce that information asymmetry and get to the point where we both have the same beliefs about the good. And then maybe the buyer will be more willing to pay a higher price now that the seller's given them a sample. So already we have an imperfect information situation where there's an information asymmetry between the seller and the buyer, and one solution is sampling. Um, when we deal with these problems, it's going to be, um, one of the things we're gonna wanna watch out for is what's called a thin market. And a thin market is just a market that doesn't have a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers in it. And the problem here is just that a thin market is going to just tend to not function well, right? Remember, one of our big assumptions for perfectly competitive markets and perfect competition is this idea of many buyers and sellers. That's where we get a good, rigorously competitive price and equilibrium emerging. So... Um, when a buyer is confronted with imperfect information, we're left to just use the main signal we have. And so if I am trying to sell you a mystery box of goods, and this is actually not uncommon, right? You can buy a box of uh, like a box of returns from Amazon or a mystery box or um, even have mystery box toys for children. All you know is that maybe you have some sense of the general context of the goods, but the only thing you really have as a measure of the quality is going to be price. And when buyers have nothing else to draw from because of imperfect information, they're going to use price to draw inferences about the product's quality, and they're going to have a hard time getting the market to equilibrium. So there's an idea that higher prices might cause greater quantity of demand and lower prices might cause lower quantity of demand, even though that's converse from the basic model of supply and demand. Um, so think about examples of that when price might not correlate directly with quality. Think about if you've ever been to a grocery outlet or a dollar store and sometimes you see something you would normally buy, but when the price is so low, you think, gosh, uh, there must be something wrong with this. I'm not going to buy it. That's too cheap, right? It, it's weird, but that happens sometimes, right? Um, versus when something is uh, very expensive, you might say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's right. Um, I'll give you an example. I bought a car on Craigslist one time, and I was looking at prices, and there were a lot of cars that were, you know, in the $5,000, $3,000 range, and then I saw a car that was $1,000, and I thought, nope. There is no way that is a reliable vehicle. There is something not being conveyed in the advertisement. Um, and I wouldn't buy it because the price was too low. That's not what the law of demand says. The law of demand says as price goes down, quantity demanded will go up. But sometimes prices can be too low and it's going to act as a signal and consumers, buyers might believe it means that the good has low quality. And so when we can't tell the quality of the good or the quality of a good or service in a market because of information asymmetries, it's going to make markets function weirdly, right? So because buyers and sellers in goods markets rely on information, um, sometimes when we have information asymmetries, we can see the use of reputation as a tool to reduce information asymmetries. And so reputation comes through in things like guarantees, warranties, branding, and service contracts to assure product quality. So going back to my example of a $1,000 car on Craigslist, if they said there was a one-year or a 10-year or a 1,000-mile warranty, 100,000-mile warranty, now I'm saying, wow, that warranty gives me a sense that this is a high-quality vehicle because you're willing to compensate me if the quality is not up to snuff. Um, if a company says, hey, we're going to do repairs for the first 10 years, or we're going to guarantee this product for a year. Um, I was just listening to an advertisement for sunglasses, and they said, you know, we guarantee it for a year against loss, damage, anything. I thought, wow, that's a pretty good product. And so reputation, brand, guarantees, warranties, and service contracts, those are all different ways that a seller can convey to a buyer, hey, 
I have faith in my product and I'm willing to kind of put my money where my mouth is and really stand by my product. Um, so that's one way in the goods market that we can reduce the risk of imperfect information. Um, in the labor market, when we have services where there's really high stakes or services where there's some amount of risk associated with low quality labor, we use things like occupational licensing, uh, certification, and other regulations to ensure competency. So think about situations where you have to have a license to do a job. Nurses, doctors, teachers, um, police officers, uh, hairdressers, right? There's a lot of different situations where you need to have a license or a certification to do the job because there's some kind of health risk, because it might not be clear what the quality of the service is until after the service has been rendered, maybe because the stakes are very high, or think about a locksmith. You, we license locksmiths because maybe it's not high stakes whether they unlock your door or not, but we like to know who has the ability to open every door in town. And so there's lots of different situations where we might use that in labor markets. In financial markets and capital markets, um, there's a lot of risk too, right? If I'm going out to take out a loan, I want to start a small business, um, they're going to use a lot of different mes methods to lower information asymmetries because I know much more about my income, my purchasing habits, my borrowing habits, and my financial history than a bank or a lender does. So they might ask me for some kind of proof of my financial history, and they might ask me for a co-signer, which is someone who goes ahead and agrees to the financial agreement with me, or some kind of collateral, like, oh, you want to take out a loan to start a small business? Okay, fine, but if you don't pay it back, I want to take something of equal value. I'll take your car or your house if you don't pay my loan back. And so in the financial market or the capital market, they reduce the risk associated with the imperfect information with things like cosigners and collateral um, just in case the risk is too high. It helps lower the risk in a situation where information is uncertain. It creates a kind of insurance. Um, the other way we can see these things come through, the other way we can see these things play out is with what's called a money back guarantee. And this is something that is not an economics only concept. You probably already know what a money back guarantee is. But the idea here is that a seller is so confident in the quality of their good that they offer to return your money if you aren't satisfied. Um, and so that's a pretty strong way of signaling that we are certain and confident about the quality of our good, and we're trying to really reduce that information asymmetry. A warranty, on the other hand, is a promise to fix or replace the good, usually for a certain period of time, but sometimes there's lifetime warranties, right? If, um, what was it, I just found out that uh, children's clothing at Target, some of the brands, they'll have a one-year warranty, and so when my son puts a hole in his pants, I can go in and return them and go buy a new pair of pants. So that's pretty great, right? Um, and then a service account is when you make a large, usually it's when a buyer makes a large purchase, um, especially with electronics, and they say, listen, uh, I'm buying this service contract, I'm buying this sort of insurance so that you agree to fix it if anything goes wrong for it. So um, if you buy like a TV or a big, bulky, expensive piece of electronics, usually a lot of retailers now will offer that at checkout. Well, would you like to have, you know, a five-year warranty or a five-year service contract on this? Um, I know even Amazon does that, right? When you go and buy something, what did I buy recently? And they were like, oh, do you want a, a service contract on that? And I said, no, it's, it's fine. I don't. But, you know, for an extra 20 bucks, they would have agreed to fix anything that went wrong with my electronics for the for, for that period of time. Um, and so the idea here is just trying to create, um, create a sense of confidence in the good. And there's examples in the book. In uh, one of the examples of a money back guarantee in the textbook is the clothing retailer L.L. Bean. In 1911, L.L. Bean began offering money back guarantees on their waterproof rubber rubber shoes. The idea there was that they would 
signal to consumers the quality of the good with this guarantee. Uh, and so the, it led to this strong reputation and this strong sense of customer satisfaction and customer loyalty because they would, um, customers knew they could always return their clothing to L.L. Bean for a full warranty. Um, and so it's not just about the information asymmetry. It is about building a sense of reputation and really reducing the risk a consumer might feel. Does that make sense? Okay. So the other thing we, can, we talked about, we talked about the idea of ways of reducing risk associated with imperfect information in labor markets. We said occupations occupational licensure or licensing um, can take place. And that's just when the government a government agency issues a license that says, hey, this worker has gotten this certain amount of training or passed a certification test um, or maybe sometimes passed a background check and therefore is able to do this job. And so if you're going in to have a surgery, you want to make sure that the doctor has enough training to do a good job while they're cutting open your body. If they make a mistake, it's a pretty high stakes situation. And so there's a high level of licensing and regulation associated with the high level of risk at play there. Um, in other markets, in the capital and financial markets, we have collateral and cosigner. A cosigner, like I said, it's just another person who, or organization, it can be a firm or an entity, and they're going to go ahead and sort of say, I'm the backup. So this is really common when you take out a loan or sometimes when you rent an apartment. So if you're a student renting an apartment and you don't have enough income to pay for the apartment on your own, you might say, hey, listen, I will pay it. And if you don't trust me, trust this person, this family member with a job, who agrees to sign and will be financially responsible if for some reason I'm not. That's what a cosigner is. And then collateral is just a thing of value, usually property, but it could be a lot of different things of value that you hold and say, listen, if I don't pay this back, you can have my very, very valuable thing. And so it's another way to provide insurance between entities or between individuals. And insurance is just a way of protecting yourself from risk. And that's where a lot of this comes in. When we think about this idea of imperfect information, what we're talking about is if the quality isn't what we perceive it to, then we're going to be at risk for some kind of loss. And so insurance can protect a person from loss, and it usually requires some kind of regular payment to an insuring entity who then promises to turn around and support you when something goes wrong. Um, so for example, if I wanted to get uh, insurance on my computer, I would make a monthly payment of $10 a month and say, listen, if and when something goes wrong with my computer, the insurance company is responsible for making sure it's okay. We have health insurance, car insurance, insurance for uh, house insur home insur homeowners insurance, renters insurance. Uh, you can get your phone insured, right? And so it's just this idea. You make small regular payments to the insurance entity in return for them being responsible for financial loss. And those small regular payments that you make to an insurance company are called premiums. And so you pay the premiums over time, and the insurance company then assumes liability, assumes responsibility for potential losses. Um, so here's a quick little table that goes over the different kinds of insurance that we see pretty commonly in markets. We have health insurance where employers and individuals um, pay for health insurance to have medical expenses covered. Life insurance is usually people, but also sometimes employers and individuals. Um, and the idea is when I die, you know, give my family this large quantity of money to help them pay for my burial and other expenses. Automobile insurance, usually individuals, but some companies have it too. And basically saying, hey, if something goes wrong with my car, you'll be there to back me up. Uh, renter's insurance, property insurance, homeowner's insurance are there in case something happens to your dwelling, um, your home, your apartment, if something's damaged, something's stolen, if there's a leak. Um, liability insurance is for firms and individuals in case something happens that you are responsible for. So if I have a construction company, I might have liability insurance in case um, 
I cause damage to a homeowner's house or maybe one of my employees falls down, something like that. And then another kind of insurance that's pretty common is malpractice insurance. And this is for doctors, lawyers, and other folks who um, might accidentally cause injury to someone through their behavior. And so if I do a bad job and it causes you harm, malpractice insurance is something that I will have paid to help make you whole. And so if I am a dentist and I have malpractice insurance and I accidentally pull out the wrong tooth, my malpractice insurance will pay you for fixing your mouth and also maybe for your pain and suffering. Does that make sense? So these are some common forms of insurance. Insurance is everywhere. Financial institutions get insurance, so banks have their own insurance. Um, there's tons of kinds of insurance, right? Cool. And then this is just a simple summary that kind of shows how it works, if it's still kind of weird to you to think about it. But the basic idea is that customers, whoever owns or buys the insurance policy, pays the insurance company. And then the insurance company is going to use all of those collected premiums together to invest and grow that money. And that's kind of how it works because you might be thinking, hey, why do I need an insurance company? I'll just, instead of paying a car insurance company, I'll just put this money in an account and then when I have an accident, it'll be there instead of in the insurance company. The idea here is that there's a certain amount of risk. And so the insurance company collects, and this is what we're going to talk about today, but the insurance company collects premiums from lots of different customers, and then they can invest that large pot of money and make a lot of investment income on it. And then the idea is that usually only one customer at a time needs a payout. And so they'll make payments to customers periodically um, and then pay their own expenses. But generally, they'll be able to grow those premiums so that they can cover any customer losses. Um, does it always work? Yeah, it usually works. We can think about famous situations where it didn't work. Um, the Great Recession in 2008 is an example where a lot of financial institutions had the same insurer. And so when one failed um, and put in a claim, many other banks began to fail and submitted claims. And then the insurance company failed, um, which is something we can talk about maybe next time when we talk about uh, financial markets, but not today. Okay. So that's how insurance works. Private insurance is when it's a private company, but there are other kinds of insurance. The government can create insurance too. There are federal and state government run insurance programs and they create a kind of social insurance. And so when we think about what a social insurance is, it's some sort of social program designed to provide a safety net for people. So some of the programs that look like private insurance or behave like private insurance are things that you've probably heard of, things like unemployment insurance. So if you are unemployed and you get unemployment benefits, that's insurance. A little bit of your paycheck every month goes towards employment insurance. And then if and when you become employed, you go back and say, hey, listen, I'm going to be, I am unemployed this week. I am not making any money. So I would like to cash in a certain amount of unemployment insurance for the time that I'm unemployed. Um, so that's one great example. And it's usually run by the state. So if you're in California, you go to the California Department of Unemployment Insurance or e, it's the Employment Development Department, EDD, and submit an application and they'll give you some kind of payment based on the money you've made in the past, the payments, the premiums you've made. There are also pension insurance programs like the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. And this is the idea that employers offer pensions to retired employees. Um, and the, uh, the employers are required to pay a small amount of what they set aside to this Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. And that way, even if the company goes bankrupt, there's still some money set aside. So if I work for a private company and I've been paying into my pension every day for the last 50 years, and the year I retire, my company goes bankrupt, 
they will have paid some money into this pension benefit guarantee corporation. And that means that even though maybe I won't get my full benefits, I'll still get something. Um, so it's sort of like an insurance for an insurance. Similar to that is deposit insurance. In the United States, we have the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. You might think you've never heard of that, but you totally have. If you've ever been to a bank and you've seen a sign that says FDIC, or you've ever heard a financial institution's advertisement, and at the end they say, member FDIC, that's what they're talking about. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, is a federal program that insures bank deposits up until a certain amount. Um, and they've raised the amount a couple of times over the last couple of decades, but the basic idea is if you put $100, $1,000, maybe up to $100,000 into a bank account and that bank fails, um, like we saw with the Great Recession, like we saw with uh, the Great Depression, like we saw in 2023 with Silicon Valley Bank, the FDIC or Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation guarantees to make you whole, basically give you your money back even if the bank lost it. So that's a, another example of uh, insurance that's provided by the government. We also have workers' compensation insurance, also known as workers' comp or workman's comp, and this is the idea that employers pay a little bit of salary money towards the government every pay period, and that way if a worker is hurt on the job, there is some money held by the government and administered by the government to compensate the worker if they're injured, and that's something that came out of the workers' rights movements um, years and years ago, and it's a nice little guarantee that, okay, if I get hurt at work, it's not my fault I was trying to do my job, so I need some support. The last thing is retirement insurance, and this is the idea that we all pay some amount of money towards the government out of our paychecks again, and that can go to systems like Social Security and Medicare, and these provide benefits, social safety net benefits, or social insurance to people towards the end of their life, after they're retired, and if they become ill. And it's, again, just another way of protecting oneself against risk in an uncertain future when we don't have information about what the future holds. So that's another example of how insurance can work. And all this is designed to reduce risk or mitigate risk. And the tricky thing is, is that we don't always know who faces higher risks. And not everyone faces the same risks. What we have to remember is that people are gonna make choices based on their experience. And so not everybody who buys insurance faces the same risk. A risk group is a group of people that have generally the same risk of something happening. So when we think about a risk group, we might think of, uh, Scuba divers are at higher risk of drowning than people living in the desert or um, people living on the coast of Florida are at much higher risk for hurricanes than people living in central Canada, right? So insurance companies recognize that people belong to different risk groups based on their demographics, their location, and other factors they will classify or group people into these risk groups and charge them different premiums, different insurance payments based on their risk group. If people are not organized into risk groups, then we would all pay the same rate and then some of us would be underpaying and some of us would be overpaying. And that would lead to really big problems in insurance markets. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about and one of the examples we're going to want to talk about in this chapter as we go through this stuff. So one of the very, very big problems with insurance markets, there's two main problems. The first one is a moral hazard problem. And a moral hazard problem is when people have insurance against something, they're going to be less careful or less likely to guard against that event. So let me give you an example of a moral hazard problem. Let's say we're in econ class and I say, listen, everybody, um, this is how you get an A in this class. You do your homework assignments, you read the textbook, you take notes, you complete your final project, you take the exams. 
and <clears throat> you do all those things and you can get a B or an A in this class. Easy peasy. But if you'd like, I can sell you course insurance. And for $5 a week, I can guarantee you a C or better. Sounds good, right? Maybe. Maybe you're, you're like, no, I'm gunning for that A. But for some people, that might sound attractive. Wow, $5 a week and I have a guaranteed C. And the assumption is you'll still try in the class, but if something goes wrong, you've got this great insurance. What are you going to do once you start paying your great insurance and you're getting busy and there's a lot going on? What kind of behavior are you going to engage in? Are you going to be more or less likely to study? You've already paid for the insurance, so you know no matter what, you've got that guaranteed C. It's going to reduce your incentive to guard against getting a D or an F. And so the idea here, that's a moral hazard. The idea here is that once you have insurance against a problem, you might behave in a riskier behavior because of that insurance. This is, at its root, an imperfect information problem. Uh, it's the insurance company having imperfect information about the behavior of the buyers of insurance, the consumers. Um, one way we can try to prevent this is things like investigations into insurance fraud. Um, insurance companies can also monitor certain kinds of behavior. And the other thing they'll do is when people have insurance claims, they will sometimes um, increase the premiums and say, hey, listen, you keep getting into car accidents, and so what we're going to do is try to incentivize you to drive more safely by raising the cost associated with your insurance claims. Does that make sense? Um, if not, I'm going to produce another little video that reviews the idea of moral hazard and asymmetric information that I think will be really helpful using some images that I have found around the internet. Um, there was an advertising campaign where they... Um, advertised insurance for the Affordable Care Act by showing pictures of people doing dumb things like rock climbing or keg stands and said, look, you're going to engage in risky behavior. You should probably have insurance. Moral hazard is like the opposite. You have insurance, so you engage in riskier behavior. Make sense? Hopefully. Okay. So another way of reducing the moral hazard, like I talked about, this is the idea that you force the insured party to pay a share of the cost. So this is the idea of deductibles. So if you get into a car accident and they say, okay, we will fix your car and we'll pay, you know, it's going to cost $5,000, we'll pay 4,500 of it, but you have to pay 500. That way, the insured person is still assuming some of the responsibility and it reduces that incentive to engage in the risky behavior. There's also what's known as a copay. A copayment or a copay is when the insurance policy holder has to pay a small amount for a service. We see this a lot with medical insurance. So, you know, maybe your doctor's appointments are free, but if you want to see a specialist, there's a $20 copay in order to help the insurance company pay for it and to make sure you're not over consuming the insured behavior. Um, Co-insurance is when the insurance company only covers a percentage of the cost. So if I had 50% co-insurance and I needed a $10,000 surgery, the insurance company would pay for $5,000 and I would pay the rest. And all of these are just different ways for the insurance company to share the cost with the insured person to try and stop them from behaving in too risky of a way. Another way that we can share um, insurance costs or manage healthcare provider incentives or uh, share insurance costs and reduce this moral hazard is to try and create incentives rather than punishment. So if you think about it, um, charging people fees is a punishment, right? It's a, it's a stick. I'm going to charge you until you stop doing that. Carrots or incentives, especially in healthcare, can be really useful. The idea here is we can say, hey, uh, this is when insurance companies give you free or low-cost preventative health or incentives to get vaccinated or something like that. The idea is we want to risk your, reduce your risk behavior and increase your less risky behaviors to try and reduce the insurance pay amounts. Um, 
In older insurance, there were programs like a fee for service where providers were paid for services they provide and then paid more for additional insurance services. Um, this is not that common. In the last 10 years, in the early 2000s, this structure has gone away generally. And now what we see a lot more is what's called an HMO or health manage maintenance organization. And this is a situation where we have um, an insurer provides health care with a fixed amount per person regardless of how many services are provided. And so the idea is you enroll in an insurance plan, you enroll in an insurance plan and you pay a fixed amount no matter how many services you get. Um, the healthcare provider uh, is only going to then get a fixed payment no matter what they do. And so they're going to have an incentive to try and reduce the costs associated with treating you because they aren't going to get paid more if they treat you more. Does that kind of make sense? Most doctors today are treated with some kind, are paid with an example, a man, uh, paid with a combination of HMO, fee for service, um, and so they get some kind of flat amount per patient, but also some additional payments for specialty cases and additional treatment. Um, but it's all this kind of complicated system to manage the incentives, manage the risk, and manage the information between the risk associated with consumers behaving in a more risky way when they're insured, trying to not overpay and incentivize the physicians and the providers to provide too much service but not too little service, and balance all of those different things. There's a lot of perverse incentives in there. Um, patients when in service with insurance are going to have an incentive to demand more care. Um, when the cost of something is very low, we're going to consume more of it in most markets. The healthcare provider is going to face different incentives based on whether they're getting a fixed payment or a fee for service payment. If the payment is fixed, then they have an incentive to try and limit the quantity of care provided. But this only works if it doesn't lead to worse healthcare problems along the way. So if we limit healthcare service too much, then maybe they say, hey, we see your arm is broken, but we're just gonna put it in a sling because we're not gonna get paid extra. And then you come back later and need surgery on your arm because you didn't get a cast. So it's really complicated and there's a lot of incentives to manage. The other big problem we face in markets with information asymmetries and a certain amount of risk, and especially in insurance markets, it's gonna be the problem of adverse selection. And this is when a group with inherently higher risks than average seek out insurance straining the system. And the idea here is that we have different populations. We have high risk people and low risk people. And if you were trying to decide whether to buy insurance or not, um, whether you were a high risk or a low risk person would factor into that. So if you think about being a relatively healthy young person, you're going to be relatively low risk. So the incentive to buy insurance is pretty low. But if you have a history of health problems, if you are in a high risk group because of your behavior, your demographics, your genetics, your age, then you might be more likely to buy insurance and if the insurance company can't tell the difference, they're going to think everybody has the same level of risk and end up losing money because they only insure high-risk people. And I'm going to show you an example of this. This is kind of hard to explain, and I think there is a really good way to see an example of it. So I'll post another video that shows it and um, either add the example in here or... Um, Okay, so here's a quick example on imperfect information, information asymmetries or asymmetric information, adverse selection, and the problem of moral hazard. And this is just a quick review of what these ideas mean and basically giving you more of a sense, an example of adverse selection, because it can be kind of a difficult um, concept, even though once we get through it, I think you'll realize you intuitively already understood it. Um, so imperfect information takes place in markets where we don't know everything. So a perfectly competitive market, we assume buyers and sellers have equal information and enough information to make good choices about the goods and services they're exchanging so they can be rational. But that doesn't always happen. Information asymmetry or asymmetric information is when one person knows more than the other. So the buyer knows more than the seller or the seller knows more than the buyer. 
And what we're going to talk about is what happens when those information asymmetries arise. They can happen in lots of markets, but they tend to happen in markets where goods are complex. So financial markets, insurance markets, healthcare markets, anytime it's hard to tell the quality of a good, we can see information be imperfect, incomplete, or asymmetric. And that's where we'll get some market failures. The two we're going to talk about in this example are adverse selection, which is also known as the lemons problem or the market for lemons, and moral hazard. So adverse selection is when a seller knows more about a good than the buyer does, we can see adverse selection or the lemons problem emerge. And remember, lemon is this term we use for a car that once you buy it, it starts to not run very well. So it's basically a, a bad purchase in terms of a car or any good, really. Um, and the idea is that if we can't tell the difference between the types of goods, then we're going to use price as the signal for quality or price as the only information. And so if I think all the goods are the same and some people are selling them for a high price and some people are selling them for a low price, I'm going to be inclined to buy the lower cost good. And the person selling a high quality good for a high price is going to have no incentive to sell that good anymore. So if consumers can't tell the difference about the quality of the goods, they're going to opt for the affordable good because they won't know it's lower quality um, and high quality goods will just get adversely selected out of the market. And that's where this term comes from. We'll adversely, unfortunately, and uh, unintentionally be selecting towards those low quality goods. So here are some examples. Um, in the first example, we have apples. And this should be pretty straightforward, right? If I've got a selection of four different apples, which apple would you pick? A, B, C, or D? Um, and if they all had the same price, I feel like I know which one you would pick without talking to you. I feel like you'd pick A, right? Apple D has already been eaten. Apple B is moldy and there's a bite missing. Apple C doesn't look terrible, but it doesn't look good. But Apple A looks perfect. So if all the apples had the same price, which one would you pick? I would pick apple A. What if they had different prices? What if they were priced in order? So A was the most expensive, then B, then C, then D. Even if D was the cheapest apple, would you buy it? Is there any reason you would buy that old wrinkled, shriveled up core of an apple? Probably not. Maybe if you really needed it for compost or something? This is not adverse selection because it's easy to tell the quality of these fruit. You can tell very clearly which of these four goods is high quality and which is low quality. And so you don't need price to tell you which one to buy. You will pay for Apple A more than you would ever pay for B, C, or D. And so we're not going to have an information asymmetry problem because the buyer and the seller both can tell the quality of the good and the seller knows that. And so they can expect the buyer being willing to pay more for a good apple that hasn't been eaten already. Now let's make it more complicated. Um, what about these cars? If I asked you to pick a car, which one would you pick? It gets a little harder to tell. They're all white cars. They're all four doors. There's uh, some little bits of information here. Some look like a little bit older body style than others. Uh, car C has a 2013 sticker on it. Car B has a spoiler. So there's some variation. Um, but if they're all the same price, which one would you pick? What if they were priced in order where A was expensive, B was less expensive, C was less expensive than that, and D was cheap? What if D was $3,000 and A was $10,000? Then which car would you pick? This is why we call this the lemon problem, because we can see this problem emerge with cars. You can tell, oops, sorry. Yeah, you can tell some things about a quality of a car by looking at it, but you can't tell much about the inside. And so adverse selection is actually called the lemon problem or the lemon market because of the problem with used cars. It can be really difficult to tell the quality of a car's engine, transmission, and other components 
just by looking at it. And so we can see it be really, uh, people be more likely to buy a cheap used car and then later find out it's a lemon than be willing to pay for an expensive used car and still it could be a lemon. And so people will just tend to buy the cheapest or the least expensive car in the used car market. So in these cases, when it's really difficult to tell the quality of a good by appearance, consumers are going to be motivated by price. And we're going to tend to see the market adversely select more and more low quality, low price goods relative to those high quality, high price goods. This happens in, like I said, lots of different markets. So let's look at how it would happen in financial markets and then insurance markets. And so in financial markets, we'll look at purchasing stocks and bonds. And let's assume we have very little information. Like here, now we have four different debt instruments. We have a stock, a bond, a certificate of deposit, um, another that's not very well defined. Um, now, if they all have the same price, which one's the best investment? It's nearly impossible to tell, right? I could say, oh, well, C's older, but is that good or bad? Um, if we had to pick based on which was cheapest or which was most expensive, it'd be even trickier, right? Maybe I'd pick the cheapest one just because if the level of risk is uncertain for every single stock or bond, then why wouldn't I just pick the cheapest one? And if I get a good return, great. And if I take a loss, okay, I didn't put that much in. Um, what if the order was reversed? What if the most expensive one was A and the cheapest one was D? How would that alter your choices? And so this is another example of how financial markets can lead to adverse selection. And as we get a little bit further, we'll talk about the ways that we can control adverse selection. And the main way we control adverse selection problems is with information. So think about used cars. Now we have things like Carfax and other accident reports that help lower that information asymmetry. We do the same thing in financial markets with financial reporting um, and other constraints. Um, because the risk and the potential reward of a financial asset or investment can be really hard to discern, really hard to tell, we see a lot of information asymmetries emerge in financial markets. So now let's talk about the market for health insurance, which is what we were talking about in this chapter. And so if you think about the market for health insurance, now I've got four people. And if you don't know anything about them, how do you decide how much to charge them for life insurance, health insurance, or anything? It's really hard. These are just, you know, four stick figures. We can't even tell gender. We have no demographic data. So who would you, would you insure all of them? What premiums would you charge each of them? How much insurance would you offer them? It can be really hard to tell. And so now we start to understand why insurance markets are so complicated and why we see insurers have difficulty trying to perceive the level of risk associated with insuring one person. So pick in your mind who you would insure for the most money and who you would who would, who would you charge the highest cost or the highest premium for insurance and who would you charge the least. Um, if you got yours picked, we've got A, B, C, and D. They're all stick figures. Uh, most of them are pretty happy. So now let's reveal some information. Let's do what insurance companies do. They ask people when they want to give them health insurance, they ask them, what's your age? What's your address? What are some of your habits? What are you employed as? And we might find out, wow, A is an 85-year-old breakdancer. Older person, higher health costs on average because of age. And also breakdancing, that's uh, not going to be easy on the joints. That's going to be risk prone, right? Accident prone. That might mean a lot of bills. Uh, B is a 43-year-old skydiving instructor with lupus. So again, high risk job, medium age, and a uh, disease, right? Lupus is one of those illnesses that stays with somebody for a long time, requires a lot of treatment. So again, a high risk, high cost person. Uh, person C is a 30-year-old librarian, young, healthy, low-risk job. That person would probably be more affordable to insure. And then person D is you. Think about yourself. What things make you a higher health risk or a more affordable health risk? And where would you rank with these other people in terms of 
how much an insurance company might want to charge you. Um, and some of these things have changed. One of the big things from the Affordable Care Act that we've been talking about in this chapter is the idea um, uh, there was a financial innovation in insurance markets where they started to call things pre-existing conditions. And the idea was if you had been sick before, it increased the probability of being sick again, especially with things like lupus. And so they would charge people more. They're not allowed to do that anymore under the Affordable Care Act, um, but there are other ways that insurance companies can try to take that into consideration. And so you can see how information plays a really big role in pricing goods and services in these markets where we have complex goods and where we have buyers and sellers having different information. Okay, cool. So. When it's difficult to get information, market failures emerge in insurance markets, in financial markets, in lots of other markets. We have lots of tools we use to lower information asymmetries, but there will still always be problems. We have applications, we have diversity in investing, and that's why we see insurers want to pool risk by having lots and lots of people in their population so that even if one person turns out to be sick, it's probably going to be balanced out by one surprisingly healthy person. And that's the big idea there. Finally, we want to talk about another problem with insurance markets and information asymmetry, and that's moral hazard. And moral hazard occurs when you give somebody insurance and then they engage in riskier behavior. And the idea here is that the information asymmetry isn't before the purchase takes place, but it's after the purchase takes place. So I go and buy health insurance and then I say, wow, now that I'm insured, I can finally go cliff jumping like I always wanted to. Um, it's really common in insurance markets, but it can take place in other markets too. Um, so this is an example here, and this is an actual advertisement that was used uh, to try and get more young people to sign up for the Affordable Care Act and insurance, um, basically trying to play up this idea that, yeah, if you get insurance, you could uh, get better health care if you engage in risky behavior. So the other example of this might take place in financial markets. In financial markets, we have a lot of regulations designed to limit risk. But that limiting of risk is basically telling the banks, hey, we're in charge of your risk. You don't have to worry about it. And so financial institutions will tend to behave in a more risky way after the regulation. We also see a big moral hazard. A lot of economists argue a lot of moral hazard takes place in the wake of the 2008 crisis when taxpayers and government bailouts um, helped keep a bunch of financial institutions from failing. And so that's another example. And then for the final example here, this is a really clear example of a moral hazard problem from the TV show Friends. Let me see if I can get the closed captions up. Nope, no closed captions today. You've really done this before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just take a big, big swing, okay? okay? Now, don't hold back. Okay. Hey! Hey! What are you doing? We're just celebrating that Joey got his health insurance back. Oh, all right. See? Now, let's try one without the helmet. So that is clearly an example of moral hazard. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's get back to the slides. So hopefully that clears things up. So that's an idea, an example of how adverse selection works and what we think about when we're thinking about adver adverse selection. And so um, we have this big population of different people, and if we can't perceive who's risky and who's not, um, we're going to tend to see the insurance company lose money, we're going to see premiums go up, and we're going to see an increasing effect of low and medium risk people seeing insurance be too expensive now and not worth buying. And so the insurance company might just exit the market altogether. It might just not be worth it for them to provide insurance. This is a pretty big example of a market failure. Um, so now we want to kind of put this all in the international context. And in the international context, we want to compare the U.S. to other developing, or sorry, other developed and high-income countries. Um, and the United States is the only high-income country in the world where private firms provide most of the health insurance. 
Um, we see greater government involvement in a lot of other markets. And the idea is that you can avoid adverse selection if everyone has the same insurance. And this gets back this, to this idea of creating public goods and limiting these kinds of problems by just saying, hey, tax it and you know, collect income tax revenue or sales tax revenue, but just collect tax revenue from everyone and then provide it to everyone. And then no one can opt out of the market and the risk is gonna be spread over the entire population. And that's what we see with what's called a single payer system where we don't have insurance paying some money and private people paying some money and all these different programs. Um, the United States spends a lot more money on medical care than other countries, and we tend to have lower medical outcomes across a lot of different dimensions. And many studies have shown this, that the country's health is related to a lot of different factors that aren't just about healthcare expenditure. It can be you know, diet, exercise, genetic factors, and cultural issues. But we can also just look at the data and, and wonder why we spend so much with so little return. And so I just popped this table in here. This might not be in your slides, but it is in the textbook. And this shows the per capita healthcare spending from 2008. These numbers have gone way up. Healthcare expenditure tends to outpace inflation on other goods. And we spend more than twice what most other countries spend per person. Our life expectancy is lower and our life expectancy is going down for both men and women. So this is from 2012 data. Um, and um, so we're going to see that that is going to be worse, right? Our, our health care expenditure has gotten more expensive. Our life expectancy has gotten lower. And our um, the last two numbers are the chance of dying before age five for male and female children per 1,000 children. So for every 1,000 children in the United States, eight will tend to die before age five um, and seven female children compared to four, six, and five in other developed countries with comparable populations. Um, and that number is also getting worse. We see a rising maternal and infant mortality in the United States. So so this is the these are the numbers from the early 2000s. Um, they've gotten a lot worse in the 2020s. Um, so that's my uplifting moment there. And you could always pretty easily look this stuff up. This data is all available. Um, the U.S. data is always available um, from U.S. government entities, but the OECD World Factbook has all this data and updates it pretty regularly. So what do we do? Um, one thing we can do is try to regulate insurance, and maybe that would be the solution to solving health care. Um, government regulation of insurance uh, began in 1871 with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Um, the idea is we want to make sure that insurances are regulated so that the insurance prices are low and that everyone has access to insurance. And insurance is generally regulated at the state level, not the federal level. And so the two goals of state insurance regulators are to keep those prices low and get as many people insured as possible especially people in high risk. People in high risk groups are more likely to be charged higher prices for insurance, so they might choose to opt out. Um, government regulators cannot force companies to charge lower prices or provide higher levels of coverage for a sustainable amount of time. And if insurance pre premiums are set too low before the actuary level, which is basically the, the level of risk associated with an individual, then some other group is going to have to make up the difference. And this is sometimes called cross-subsidization. But if I have a high-risk person and a low-risk person, but I can't charge the high-risk person the full high-risk premium, then maybe I charge the low-risk person a little bit more so I can charge the high-risk person a little bit less. That's that idea. Um, in terms of government intervention, there are two basic groups who make up the difference between these two premiums. It can either be other buyers of insurance or taxpayers. So in some cases, the U.S. government um, does step in and provide insurance for people. And there's generally two groups for whom the government will step in and provide some, if not all, insurance costs. And that's going to be in the case of low-income people who get access to Medicaid and for people aged over 65. The older you get, the more likely you are to have health problems. So um, Medicare insures, or is at least supplemental insurance, for people over the age of 65. 
Another common government intervention is what's known as a mandate. And we see this more commonly than you think. There was a lot of disagreement around the Affordable Care Act insurance mandate, but in California, we have a mandatory car insurance program. Um, there's also mandatory homeowners insurance in many states. And the idea is that you cannot, it would create too many social problems if people were allowed to skip that insurance. And so we mandate it. There are alternatives, though. Um, in the case of car insurance, if you are willing to put a certain amount of money aside in an account, um, in an escrow account, then you can get out of car insurance. And so the idea is if you have, you know, $10,000 sitting in an account at any given time, okay, you don't need car insurance, but that money can't be touched. It has to sit there um, in case you're in a car accident. Um, most of us, though, just take the easy way out and get insurance. And so that's another really common insurance intervention from the government is mandating it. And that will solve that adverse selection problem because then everyone has the insurance, the high risk people and the low risk people and even the medium risk people. Um, so bringing it back to what we were talking about at the beginning, the idea of patient protection and the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act was designed to increase insurance for everyone by invoking what's called an individual mandate, basically saying all individuals have to get health insurance. And the idea was to reduce, again, that adverse selection problem. If everyone gets health insurance, then we'll have the entire population's risk collected, and it's going to lower the average risk and lower the average premium cost. So if you don't get health insurance through your employer or a government program, you have to go get personal health insurance or be subject to a fine. Each state also was required to have health insurance exchanges, which is basically a way to um, force insurance companies to compete with each other, creating a market so that consumers could try to shop around for better products, better insurance products, and lower prices. The other thing was uh, the Affordable Care Act created an employer mandate. So in addition to the individual mandate that, you know, people had to um, get their own insurance, it also mandated that employers, anyone with more than 50 employees, must offer health insurance to their employees. And so the idea was to just expand health insurance coverage and make it competitive so that more people would be incentivized to get health insurance and we could lower premiums and possibly make the market more efficient. So that's the big idea there. That is health insurance, risk, and information. So that's it. That's information, risk, and insurance. And so the big idea here is that information is important. It plays a role in how markets work. And it's not always perfect. It can be imperfect and it can be asymmetrical. Um, information and lack of information can create risk. And then we can protect against that risk with regulation, with guarantees, and with different forms of insurance. But even those insurance markets are going to be subject to risk and information. Hopefully that clears it all up. Let me know what questions you have and I will see you next time. Take care.